All that thrills my soul is Jesus. I hope you sing that with truth, that that is the one and only thing that thrills your soul. You may be cheerful about some other things, but the thing that thrills your soul is the Lord Jesus Christ. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture we read just a few moments ago. And for those of you who are listening over the Internet, I apologize that we do not have video this morning. Last week, our um, little gizmo, uh, which is uh, uploads the videos, burned out in the middle of the service, and uh, I couldn't get one delivered before Friday. It's on order, and hopefully we'll have it next week. But to compound that, um, we had moved the camera down here uh, this morning, or actually I did that last night, and in the process um, of plugging the RCA cable into it, it pulled out some of the guts of the camera and broke the camera. <laughs> so this morning, we do have on, <coughs> we're going over the internet via sound, but not by picture, and <coughs> we're also recording it, of course, on CD. And then for those of you who are not familiar with us here, we have our uh, organ for the presbytery called Redeeming the Time. There are copies of that out on the table right outside the door by the bulletins. And then also, uh, we have the Acts and Facts from the Institute for Creation Research. This is the new quarterly magazine, and we encourage you to pick those up on your way out this morning. Now, we're over in the book of Exodus, and we're in Exodus chapter 15, a rather exciting passage. Yes, oh yes, and Keith has another announcement. Keith, would you like to stand up and give that? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that the next Friday fun night will be this Friday, 815. Have everyone there. And so you're invited to Friday Fun Night. And that's not just for little kids, that's for everybody. And you will have a great time. So please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we looked at just a moment ago in Exodus chapter 15. Starting a new series here today. And I hope that it will be a very profitable series for you because we'll be dealing with music in the Bible. Now first I want to review and give you a quick overview because this is the background for the series that we're about to begin. What we've learned so far in the text, which is the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, where we saw 1,200 flat tires all at once, we learned some principles, five principles. Number one, obedience produces blessing and fulfillment of the promises of God. Number two, sometimes it takes a season for God to answer our requests, but his timing is best. The children of Israel cried out for a very long time before God finally decided now was the moment. Number three, when part of creation can fulfill the will of God, he uses it. The land was dry after being blown on for the duration of the night. It was dry, it was not mud or marsh, as the liberals would have you believe. Principle four, we're accountable to act when God commands us before we can receive his blessing. You must act when God gives you a command. You don't wait for him to do something. Moses had to act first. God waited for Moses to obey before sending the wind and parting the sea. Principle number five, Verse 21, we saw in the previous chapter, parallels what happened to creation. God is creating again here in chapter 14, where he is making a new nation, Israel. And today, when a person trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, God creates a new creature. That's what Paul says. When you trusted Christ, God made you into a new creature. You went from death to life and from darkness to light. You were on instead of the side where the Egyptians had darkness so, so dark they could feel it, over on the side where the Israelites had light all night long. Then we looked at the 12 different terms for wall in the New Testament because those waters stood on both sides of them and it was dry in the middle. We saw that the word used in Exodus was a protecting wall, a massive city wall. We saw many other places in the Old Testament where that word is used, always of a massive city wall like the walls of Jericho and the wall of Jerusalem in the days of Jeremiah. It was not wet ground. It was not Pharaoh getting his chariot stuck in the mud. It was a wall on both sides of them. Pharaoh couldn't circumvent them and go around and head them off at the pass. It was a wall at least 600 feet tall because they crossed the Red Sea at a place which we discussed, which is about 600 feet deep. It was a clear miracle. Six million people were clearly not wading through mud in a swamp. We made several practical observations on the text. Number one, the reason for the strong east wind blowing all night off the very dry Saudi Arabian Peninsula was to evaporate and dry the seabed, not to hold up the walls of water. A wind that would be strong enough to hold up massive walls of water 600 feet deep would have blown the Israelites and the Egyptians all the way across Africa. The second practical observation 
The reason that the Egyptians followed the Jews into the sea was the fear of Pharaoh was clearly greater than the fear of a miraculous phenomenon. I hope you picked that up in the song of the text today. That's a song. Those first 21 verses in Exodus 15 are a song, and it explains this to us. The fear of Pharaoh was greater than the fear of the miraculous phenomenon. They had begged Pharaoh before, but they'd never rebelled during those ten supernatural plagues against Egypt. And it's a possible, we don't know for sure, but a possible rationale was they thought, well, if the water falls, uh, it'll get the Jews as well as getting us. And they also believed that Pharaoh was God and thought he would take care of them. You know, it's stupid to trust the wrong God. It's really stupid to trust the wrong God. He cannot do anything for you. All the way through the Old Testament, Israel stupidly kept going after false gods because those gods were fun. Do you ever wonder why Israel followed after Baalim and the Ashtarot, the Baals and the Ashtaroths? Why in the world did Israel do those stupid things? Is because they had fun. You remember the matter of Baal Peor? You remember Balaam, who could not curse Israel, finally told Balak, the king of Moab, well, listen, here's what you do. You take your pretty little girls and you send them down there to the camp of the Israelites and they'll seduce them and they'll start committing fornication and God will judge them. Then you won't have to worry about fighting them. And that's what happened. And Phineas, in a rage, took a javelin and he ran it through to a man and a woman who were fornicating. A woman who was of the Moabites and he killed them both and God's hand of judgment was stayed. Do you understand why people today follow false gods? Why there's a lot of false god worship? Through music, by the way, in so-called evangelical churches today, is because it's fun. It stimulates the flesh. Be careful. We see that here in our text. Practical observation number three. The text clearly states, and we saw that in chapter 14, that the Egyptians knew the name of the true God. After all, they had personal experience of seeing and feeling the pain of the ten plagues done against Egypt. And so they speak of him as Jehovah, as the Lord, in chapter 14. They know his name, his covenant name. Practical observation number four. The Egyptians knew that they were facing and fighting the true God, but continued to do it until the very last minute. There are people all around us just like that. They know God's there, but they're going to fight him to the very last minute. They had seen the witness of God's chosen people for years, just like America has heard the gospel for years, and they still rejected it. Remember, even in America, as then in Egypt, stubborn rebellion always fights against God until it is too late. Then we answered some questions and issues that needed to be resolved. First, how many chariots were there? The obvious answer is there was a minimum of 600 because it says that Pharaoh's chosen chariots, there were 600 of them. But in context, that appears to be a statement of the elite personal chariot guard for Pharaoh. Egypt at that time was the world's superpower. And there were millions of people involved in this incident. Do you think that if you have a minimum of two million Jews, and I think it was closer to six million, if you had six million Jews, the six hundred chariots could beat them. I suppose they just turned around and just let the chariots run over them. I mean, that's going to slow them down a little bit. And then the guys on the side will grab the Egyptians, pull them out, and whack them. I think you got a lot more than just the minimum of six hundred chariots. Because it says in verse 7, and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. This is world superpower we're dealing with here. So the actual number of chariots might have been greater, perhaps five to ten times that number, maybe 3,000 to 6,000. When you think miracles and judgments of God, think on a shock and awe scale. This is a wipeout of the world's number one superpower of the time. Shock and awe. Second, how many wheels does that make that God knocked off simultaneously? Well, of course, we usually think in terms of two-wheeled chariots. But Egypt also had, as we said before, four-wheeled chariots capable of carrying multiple soldiers to the front lines of the battle. If all the chariots were two-wheeled, and if only 600 chariots of the personal guard entered the sea, that's a minimum of 1,200 wheels that had simultaneous flat tires. If there were 3,000 to 6,000 two-wheeled chariots, that's 6,000 to 12,000 wheels that all fell off at once. If all the chariots were four-wheeled chariots, that gives a whopping maximum number of 24,000 wheels that fell off simultaneously. Okay, let's go back to minimums again. 
If you have two to four horses pulling even 600 chariots, you have 1,200 horses. Those are huge animals in total panic. Imagine the maximum number of, if every chariot had four horses, that's nearly 100,000 maniac horses gone insane. Think anybody got trampled? When you think miracles and judgments of God, think big without the minimum number. It's obvious to see why there was an instant chaos among the charioteers and recognize the sovereign hand of God. The probability of 1,200 minimum, 24,000 maximum, wheels falling off simultaneously is infinitesimally small. There is no probability that that could happen by chance or by accident. Even a pea-brained drug addict on angel dust could reach that conclusion that this was a miracle and not just chance. As we said before, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, some of you like drag racing. At that moment, we have the very first recorded drag race in history. God took off their chariot wheels that drave them heavily. They dragged them, in other words. So if the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth against them, against the Egyptians. They dragged the chariots. There was your drag race. Never tried to tow a car with no wheels. How fast can it go? Imagine the thousands of horses dragging chariots with no wheels. Imagine the chaos of at least hundreds and possibly thousands of chariots and horses trying to make a U-turn simultaneously in the pitch dark that you can feel. I mean, we're talking terror, we're talking chaos. Even among highly trained, highly skilled military personnel, crack soldiers, abject terror is what's going on. And that's the song of joy and rejoicing that we see in chapter 15. How God did it. The armies of earth have absolutely no hope against the God of heaven. There's coming another battle like this in Revelation chapter 19. Where the Lord Jesus Christ returns to earth and all those who have trusted in him behind him and the Antichrist and all of his host of earth who've been fighting among themselves realize they've got a bigger enemy and they all turn. Battle of Armageddon's going on. They turn and they fight against the Lord of Heaven. Do you think they're going to win? He will squash them like a worm. People, we're talking shock and awe. We're talking about the nations of the earth standing in awe of the God of Heaven. We're talking about God moving in human history because He will be glorified. I hope you get that. That is the God whom you serve. That is the God whom you worship. Don't ever treat him lightly. Too often we're flippant about the God whom we worship. He is the Lord and greatly to be feared and greatly to be praised. There is no searching of his judgments. And we see here his judgment and the rejoicing of God's people when he delivers them from the most terrible superpower of the earth on that time. Powerful pictures that we're giving here. How long did it take to cross the Red Sea? That's where we ended with. There's, is there enough time? You know, a lot of people criticize and say, well, there's no, uh, you know, how could they get across the sea in whatever time you have allotted there? Well, certainly if you're only crossing up the Gulf of Suez, you don't have any problem with the time. But where the text tells us they crossed, they crossed over into Arabia. Paul says so in Galatians. Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. And there's no question in the text. There are no textual errors in the text where Paul writes that. There are no divergent manuscripts that say Sinai Peninsula, they crossed into Arabia. It's not a mistranslation because in the Greek text, it spells it out in Greek letters, Arabia. They crossed into Arabia. Not some other place. Sinai was never part of Arabia. That's because God is showing a miracle. Not a, well, I guess we could have figured out this way mechanically. He is giving shock and awe to the nations of the earth to know that this is his people and he is their God. And how stupidly 
after the death of Joshua and the elders that outlived Joshua, they turned away to Baalim, to Baals, to false gods. And we've been in the period of the judges. Well, back to what we're talking about here. It was 118 miles at that point. We talked about the minimum amount of times established in the text. It might have been longer, but we have a minimum amount of 24 hours because it starts in the morning and it ends in the morning. Uh, as they cross the sea, that means that they are going for at least 24 hours across. That averages out. And remember, the Jews were in a panic at this point. They've got the Shekinah glory between them and the Egyptians, but they're crossing the sea. They can hear those guys behind them. They know what's going to happen to them if the Egyptians catch, catch them up. You know, they're running as fast as they possibly can to get across the sea. If you travel at an easy jog, I used to be a runner and you know that, 12 miles a minute, that's a slow jog. That works out to be 5 miles an hour. And at 5 miles an hour, you can go 120 miles. And the sea is 118 miles at that point. And we know they didn't see the Egyptians on the same side that they started because they would have still been in Egypt and they would not have crossed. But it says in the text that they saw the Egyptians dead, drowned, washed up on the shore after they got across the sea. Folks, we got a miracle here. And you got to remember, we also pointed out that the Jews were in prime physical shape according to the inspired text and that they were clearly scared out of their wits. Book of Psalms tells us that there was not not even one feeble person among them when they left. We also need to remember that after creation, the crossing of the Red Sea is the principal miracle of the Old Testament, and the Bible repeatedly refers to the Exodus at the point at which God brought Israel into a nation into existence. That's a real miracle when he did that. Remember, think shock and awe when you think about miracles and powers and judgments of God. Remember, God's making a point that all the nations of the earth would know that he is God alone. That's one of the key themes of the entire Old Testament. It's clearly also what God had in mind in preparation for the conquest of the promised land. We saw the purpose of God to shock in all the nations in multiple passages. In Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, 1 Samuel, 1 Chronicles, Psalms, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and other major and minor prophets. We saw the shock and awe is clearly one of God's purposes in the words of Rahab to the spies in Joshua 2. Before they had laid down, she came up to them on the roof, and she said unto them, I know that the Lord hath given you, and she uses the name Yahweh, Jehovah, it's all capital letters, L-O-R-D, which means that that's the Hebrew name Jehovah behind it in the Hebrew text. The Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard, remember God was doing this for a purpose, not just to kill Egyptians, but for the shock and awe purpose of how it would affect the nations. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Why did God do it? Shock and awe to the nations. Whoa, there is a God who does stuff. Not just these gods that we think are doing stuff. And he's the God of that people. He's the God of Israel. That's shock and awe, folks. That brought us to where we closed on January 1st. A very rare, exciting word in the text. It's found in chapter 15. We read it this morning, though I didn't emphasize it. The Song of Moses and the Children of Israel. Then with an antiphonal response from Miriam and the women with her. It was in verse 8. I read it a moment ago, but I'm going to read it again for you. Verse 8. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright as an heap. And here's the phrase. And the depths were congealed. That's our key word. Were congealed in the heart of the sea. We saw that that very same word is used in the book of Job, who describes for us what the word congealed means. Job 10.8, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as this day, as the clay, and wilt thou bring me unto dust again? Hast thou not poured me out as milk? And now here's our word. 
It's translated congealed over there in Exodus. It's translated here, curdled me like cheese. What God did to the water shows an incredible power. He made the water curdle like cheese. Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, thou hast fenced me with bones and sinews. The word curdle, tafa, to shrink, to thicken, to congeal. Like a clouded sky, but not ice, which expands as it freezes and therefore floats on the top of the water. God didn't freeze the water because that would have frozen the entire thing. He wouldn't have had any liquid water underneath. He would have had to freeze the entire sea there. It's when it freezes, the ice moves to the top. It floats up from the bottom. Therefore, the depths of the sea never freeze. But the depths of the sea are described here as curdling like sea. That's what Job said. The depths of the sea have curdled like cheese. Water is, as we explained, a non-compressible substance. Even with a great weight on top of it in the deepest ocean trenches, it's still water, although it can crush submarines and creatures that do not have a counterbalancing internal pressure. We talk about the deepest known underwater valley in the ocean, the Marianas Trench off the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. It's approximately 7.5 miles deep. But even here, with all that crushing pressure, the water is still liquid water. Experiments have been done to compress water even more than this with huge machines and just a tiny little bit of water. And you know what? When you have that much pressure, the water curdles like cheese. Now here's the miracle. The water didn't overflow its banks when God held it up. There was pressure on all sides both inside and on top and on the edges, all the way around, there was pressure on all sides for a path 118 miles wide. Pressure on top, bottom, and sides. You've got a miracle, folks. Don't let anybody ever talk you out of the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea. All the liberals and all the compromisers want to tell you that it didn't really happen or that it was in a different location where they waded through the marshes, you know, up on the northern part of Egypt. We talked about Ramses II and the wrong dates for the Exodus. It's in 12, you know, he's around 1250. And that's where they want to put the Exodus up there during that time and have him crossing the bitter marshes up at the top. Forget it. This is a miracle that took place. It's the God of the universe who spoke a word and everything came into being. Certainly, he knows how to hold a little tiny bit of water, a very small body of water compared to all the oceans of the earth, how he can get his people across. Do you not think we serve a God that's that big? Oh, people, fear before the Lord and tremble. Worship in the beauty of holiness, which, by the way, the Hebrew there is in holy festive garb. Holy festive garments. I wrote my baby thesis at seminary on that in Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. Yeah. In holy festive garments, the garments of priests. And we're described in the book of Revelation when we come back with the Lord Jesus Christ wearing holy festive garments, clad in white, as we come back with him as the conqueror. The Bible ties together as well as the miracles of the Bible. Well, I'm getting off the topic. <laughs> We're never going to finish if I don't preach what I've got for today. Okay, so that brings us back to Sing unto the Lord, Part 1. Let me give you the introduction. We've got here a song. We've got a musical narration in these verses of Scripture. It's called the Song of Moses. Music plays a key role in the Scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Many of the songs are recorded for us. Bad music is mentioned in the Bible, such as the music at the worship of Baal. Good music is also mentioned. For example, the entire book of Psalms is a musical hymnal for ancient Israel. Different individual people are mentioned singing in the Bible. Different groups of people are mentioned singing. The Bible tells us that God himself sings in the book of Zephaniah. Did you know that God sings? and that he sings over you with rejoicing. I don't want to get into that today, otherwise we won't finish the rest of the message. We'll get into it eventually. <laughs> but uh, God himself sings. The Bible says so specifically. The Bible also tells us that the devil is a musical being. Did you know that? That the devil is a musical being, that he actually has musical instruments built into 
his form that God made him in? We'll talk about that when we get to it. Satan is interested in music. Music was commanded in the Old Testament. God commanded certain groups of people with special and distinct qualifications to participate in worship and in the singing in worship, first in the tabernacle and later in the temple. There are different kinds of poetic songs that are actually written out in detail for us in the Bible. There are songs before going into battle. There are victory songs, such as the one that we've got in our text this morning. There are songs to be sung during the ascent to Jerusalem for the feast days. There are songs designed to curse the enemies of God, such as the imprecatory psalms. There are songs used in worship and praise, which, by the way, are totally different from the so-called praise and worship activities that goes on in the modern church. There are love songs, such as the beautiful Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs. That's the epitome of songs. That's the way it's titled. Shir Sherim. The Song of Songs, which are Solomon's. The New Testament tells us that there are a variety of types of music that are appropriate in the worship of the church. And the New Testament breaks them down into categories of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There are songs and music mentioned in the book of Revelation that will be sung in heaven during the Great Tribulation. And some that will be sung throughout all of eternity. Since the Bible has so much to say about songs and music, it's imperative that we learn what music pleases God and what music is an abomination to Him. We must remember that Satan is always trying to corrupt the worship of God and to direct worship to himself. Since one of the principal ways in which God has commanded the worship of himself is music, we can expect a direct attack in this area from the devil. We also need to remember that music was central to the Protestant Reformation. This church stands firmly in the traditions of the great Protestant reformers and as is clearly stated in our church brochure under worship and music, quote, we consistently and consciously seek to maintain a robust though traditional form of worship and music consistent with our heritage stemming from the Protestant Reformation. We believe that such worship and music honors God. We still sing the great hymns of the faith that are doctrinally sound and musically articulate. Others may choose a different course, but we have specifically and deliberately chosen not to employ contemporary Christian music, CCM, or blended worship. The services of this church are designed for worship, not for entertainment or to make people feel good. Other contemporary forms of worship are readily available in other churches. To copy them would merely make us redundant and therefore unnecessary. It is our conviction that bringing the decadent musical forms of the world into the church fails the test of practical separation and is one of the primary causes of spiritual apathy, ecumenical and charismatic seduction, defection from the final authority of scripture, general compromise and doctrinal deadness in modern evangelical churches." Unquote. In particular, as we look at the Reformation, God gifted Martin Luther with both intellectual skills, academic training, a love for scripture, a fearless character, and a precise point in history. But God also gifted him as a talented musician who thought carefully about the place of music in worship. Calvin himself developed a philosophy of church music that still has an impact today. A name that perhaps you have not heard is that of John Merbecki, associated with the first English prayer book. Who's not heard of the great Lutheran musician, Johann Sebastian Bach, who dedicated all of his prodigious musical output on many different instruments and for the magnificent human voice. Oh, I love Bach's vocal music. He dedicated it to the glory of God. And he wrote that on each manuscript that he wrote. And sometimes when he got to a difficult place, he would write in the margin, Jesus, help me. <laughs> He was focused on music that glorified God, and that's why he wrote it. Praise God he did. It still blesses us today. And what legacy he left, not only in his musical compositions that had a musical impact, not only on the church of his day, but down to the present, not to mention his children who carried on the great heritage of their father. And another of the great reformed musical tradition was George Frederick Handel with his multiple oratorios. The most well-known, of course, is the Messiah. No doubt you're also familiar with the Psalter of Isaac Watts. And even on the Arminian side of the aisle, we find those who followed the musical patterns set by the Reformers. Their theology didn't follow the Reformers, but their musical patterns did. John Wesley's first hymn book, the prolific writings of his mus uh, musical brother Charles, both of whom followed the gift of their father Samuel Wesley. Did you know that the music of the Wesleys 
following the patterns of the Reformation extended to the second and third generation? Do you know anything about John Mason Neal and the Tractarian hymnody? What changes came in with Iris Sankey and the growth of gospel hymnody? You know, the Pope hated the music of Martin Luther, and he once stated that Luther had, quote, sung more people into Protestantism than he preached into it, unquote. Do you know that because of the impact of the Reformation, the impact of the Reformation, that there were even papal pronouncements on music in the 20th century? Do you understand how important music is? There's a war going on in the world of music. Are you aware that the Jews sing hymns based on the Old Testament musical portion, such as the one we have for our text today, and that some of the Jewish hymns have also been affected by the Reformation musical tradition? and all the developments that took place during that time. Folks, the Reformation had a powerful impact in the area of music, and the church today is moving away from it and from what music glorifies God. Music and the worship of God, that's one of the key battlegrounds of the church today. It's a vicious battle. Satan has made some fearsome advances in the so-called evangelical churches of our day. In short, his advances are principally in the churches that have begun to compromise in three different sets of doctrines. In the doctrines of separation. Number two, in the doctrines related to the inspiration and preservation of scriptures. Number three, the doctrines related to the fiat creation of the world ex nihilo, that is in six literal days out of nothing, without the use of any form of theistic evolution and with God resting on the seventh day. And I can tie musical trends in churches that deny something about those three different areas. Music makes a huge impact on the body and the emotions. It's not fully under the control, if it's not fully under the control of the Holy Spirit, working on the regenerated human spirit of those who are saved, music then becomes the tool of the devil and a vessel for dragging believers into the most abominable forms of moral decadence and depravity while they stupidly think that they're worshiping God. Oh, the compromises the people fall into because of the so-called music, the bail music that they play in their churches. Okay, well now that's, that's just an introduction to Exodus 15 and the Song of Moses. I hope that it uh, jars you awake, however, into the seriousness of the topic of music in the Bible. But before we begin looking at verse 1, we have to look first at the book of Revelation because did you know that the Song of Moses is sung at the end of time? We're called, it's called the Song of Moses here in Exodus chapter 15. It's also called the Song of Moses over in the book of Revelation. It's sung at the creation of the nation of Israel, but that's not the last time that it will be sung. Let me read you. These are easy chapters to remember. Exodus 15, Revelation 15. They're both numbers 15. Exodus 15, Revelation 15. Let's all say it together. Exodus 15, Revelation 15. Okay. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand upon the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Now look at verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee? In other words, this is a declaration to the nations, just like the crossing of the Red Sea was. Shock and awe! Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts girded with golden girdles, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, that's bowls, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Takes you back to Isaiah chapter 6. And they, the king Uzziah, died. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Oh, and then John tells us in John 12, who was it that Isaiah saw? where the smoke fills the temple, where the pillars are shaking. John chapter 12 tells us it was Jesus. Isaiah saw Jesus. He was the judge. Who's the judge here in Revelation? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus himself said all judgment, the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. Jesus is not only the Savior, he's the judge. If you reject him, you will stand before him as your judge. You'd better make sure you know Christ, because if you don't, you will be judged by him and headed for hell. That's the point of all these passages. All of them tie together, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. The central focal person is Jesus Christ. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. We're talking judgment, folks, just like in Exodus. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. The crossing of the Red Sea was designed to strike fear and awe into the hearts of all the rest of the world. Did you get that? The bold judgments, that is the vile judgments here, are the final seven judgments of the Great Tribulation. You've got the seal judgments, you've got the trumpet judgments, and now you're coming down to the most concentrated and most destructive of all the judgments, seven bold judgments that God's going to pour out on the earth just before Christ returns. And they're described for us in Revelation chapter 16. They're the most massive, destructive, fearful judgments of the entire tribulation, and they're also designed to strike fear and awe worldwide. But you know, astoundingly, just like Pharaoh's troops, the people of earth know that God is the one behind the plagues. They know it. But they still refuse to repent. They still follow the Antichrist, just like the Egyptians stupidly followed Pharaoh. In fact, they even cursed God and refused to repent. Listen, Revelation 16. This is where the bold judgments are being poured out is in Revelation 16, very next chapter. It says, The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and listen, blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now, how stupid can you get? How stupid can you get? They know it's God. They know he's the one who's been sending all the judgments. They know who he is. And they shake their fist at him and they curse him. And they refuse to repent. Talk about a hard heart. How about verses 10 and 11? The fifth angel poured out his veil upon, vial upon the seed of the beast. His kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Verse 11, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. How hard is your heart? You're going to be stubborn. Okay, I'll be stubborn. I'll shake my fist at God. I won't do what I'm told. I have my own life to live. I'll do it my way. I really don't care what God says about it. Be careful. You're shaking your fist in the face of Almighty God. It's my body. I'll do with it what I want. I'm having fun doing what I'm doing. I don't care what God says about it. Be careful. God brings all these judgments just like he did the Red Sea. And the people who kept doing that did it till the last minute when it was too late to repent. Your sin will find you out and the wages of sin is death. Do you need to make something right with God? You better get your act together. You need to make something right with God. You better humble yourself instead of being proud and saying, I don't care. Do you have some sin in your life that needs to be confessed? Which you need to repent of? Don't wait until it's too late. Pharaoh's troops did. The people in Revelation did. You know, we should expect that from unregenerate men who've refused God during the Age of Grace and who've missed the rapture. We've already seen it in earlier chapters in Revelation. By the way, join us on Sunday evenings. I'm almost through with the book of Acts, and the Lord willing, we'll be starting the book of Revelation when I finish the book of Acts. Look at Revelation chapter 2. We find in the church, 
the letters to the seven churches are not just to individual churches in the book of Revelation, but they give us seven different types of churches which you find throughout all of church history. And here's in relation to a church and Jezebel, and it says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So this kind of thing goes on in the church age to people who are in churches but who refuse to repent. Chapter 9, verse 20, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of. You say, well, I don't worship idols. Okay, well, let's look at these other ones. Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries. By the way, that's pharmakeia. That's the Greek word for, you know, illicit drug use, drug-induced hallucinations and things like that. Nor of their fornication, sex. That's a big deal today, isn't it? Nor of their thefts. Well, it was just a little thing. I just pocketed it because I didn't have 15 cents to buy that candy bar. Of course, you can't buy them for 15 cents anymore. <laughs> you get it? People who refuse to repent. People who refuse to repent of their sins. They make excuses for it. What makes you think you're saved if you refuse to repent of your sins? That's the character quality of the unregenerate. That's the character quality of those who blaspheme God. That's the character quality of Pharaoh's soldiers who waited till the last minute and it was too late. Why do they do this? Our time is up. We should have gotten farther. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll talk about why they do it next week, but if you want to read the passage and see if you can figure it out, the passage that I would look at for that is 2 Thessalonians. Write it down. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 14. See if you can find it there. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. You are the God who, when you judge, produce shock and awe. The kings of the earth are as nothing compared to you. You are the God who, in a word, created the heavens and the earth the sea, the dry land, and all that in them is. You are the God who redeemed your people Israel with a mighty hand. With a high hand you brought them across the sea. You are the God who has redeemed us with the most fearsome of judgments who were poured out upon your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he died in our place. The God of heaven become man. Oh, Father, how we thank you for him. You receive the glory, for you have done it all. For Jesus is not only our Savior, but for those who reject him, he is their judge. And he will judge those who repent not, who shake their fist, who blaspheme the God of heaven, who insist on their fun and pleasurable ways because the flesh is more important to them than all of heaven and all of eternity. Father, bring us to our senses before it's too late. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today, if I can figure out what I'd do with my bulletin, is number 515, Since I Have Been Redeemed. Israel was redeemed across the Red Sea. 